We do have a full program today, so we are going to try and start on time once again. Thank you all very, very much for coming on time. We really appreciate your presence here. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening slash afternoon, depending on where you're calling us from. On behalf of For the Love of Creation and Citizens for Public Justice, I would like to welcome each and every one of you to our webinar titled Preserving Biodiversity, Creation Care from Faith to Action. Let me begin as I should with acknowledging the history and present of the land from which I'm speaking to you today. For years, I personally have been living as an uninvited guest on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded lands of the Musqueam and Squamish peoples in so-called Vancouver, who have lived here for thousands of years, stewarding and protecting the land and the diversity of its creation long before Western concepts of biodiversity were conceived of. I also encourage all of those um, who can to write in the chat a brief acknowledgement of where you personally are joining us from today. Um, in light of today's discussion, however, let us do a little bit more than just acknowledging the history of this land. Let us also commit to a shared path of truth and reconciliation to learn more about our relationship to the land through our hosts and to unlearn what compels us to keep pushing the planet and the rest of creation towards an unmitigated climate and ecological catastrophe. Perhaps I should also start with a brief personal introduction. My name is Mario Wahba, and I am the Climate Justice Policy Analyst and Communications Coordinator at Citizens for Public Justice. I also sit on the Coordinating Committee for the Love of Creation, and here are a few logistical notes about our webinar for today. There will be a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Please note down your questions and you will be able to share them during the Q&A session, either via the chat feature or by unmuting yourself and asking your questions out loud. Um, if you do want to uh, ask your question out loud, I'll ask you to please use the raise your hand uh, virtual function. Um, and I will also respectfully ask you to remain on mute for the time of the presentation so that we can clearly hear our panelists. Uh, the webinar will be recorded um, and it will be shared with those who registered uh, on the Zoom registration page. The webinar was organized um, in the context of Give It Up for the Earth, which is a Linton environmental campaign organized this year by Citizens for Public Justice and for the love of creation. Please, if you haven't done so already, join our growing campaign by adding your voice to our open letter, which is addressed to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada, Stephen Guibault. Um, it only takes less than a minute to sign up, um, but it's tremendously helpful in shedding light on the shortcomings of our federal climate policies. And for your convenience, I am going to put the chat right here, sorry, to put the link in the chat for everyone. Please take the time either now or in a little bit to um, add your voice to give it up for the earth and sign the open letter. Uh, if you want to learn more about the campaign, um, uh, or register your community, whether that's faith community or local community to participate, please also visit that second link that I included in the chat. Okay, without further ado, let me introduce our panelists for today in the order in which they will speak. Mark Hathaway is the executive director of the Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and, and Justice. He holds a doctorate in environmental studies and adult education from the University of Toronto, where his research has focused on sustainability and sustainability education, environmental ethics, and sustainable food production. Mark is the principal author with um, Leonardo Boff 
of the Tao of Liberation, Exploring the Ecology of Transformation, which has sold over 10,000 copies in English, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and German. His academic publications appear in journals such as Worldviews, uh, Consulium, and Environmental Ethics, while his book chapters have been published by Cambridge University and the University of Toronto Press. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Pleasure to have you. And next we have Monica Tang, who is a board member, uh, who is a member of the board of directors for Citizens for Public Justice. Monica is also a senior advisor with the Canadian Coast Guard, having previously worked in other departments such as Fisheries and Oceans and Environment and Climate Change Canada in areas ranging from sustainable development, um, sustainable development policy and reporting to modern treaty negotiations and implementation with indigenous governments. Always thankful to have your insightful contributions. Monica, thank you so much. And working with an advisory circle, um, Faith and the Common Good and the Laudato Si movement, Agnes Richard launched the Global Catholic Climate Movement Canada chapter in 2019 and continues as coordinator of the Laudato Si movement in Canada which is a nationwide network of hundreds of Christians focused on raising awareness about Pope Francis's letter to the world, now that we see on care of our common home. Um, the movement is inspiring those who share our faith to act publicly to um, bring the values of ecological and social justice to life in Canada. He also initiated the Catholic Eco-Investment Accelerator Project in 2021 with the help of faith and the common good and the sponsorship of the Catherine Donnelly Foundation. Agnes co-authored the Catholic Eco Investment Accelerator Toolkit released in January 2022, which has since gained global recognition. Agnes was certified as climate reality leader by Honorable uh, Vice President Al Gore and the Climate Reality Project in July of 2015. Agnes held an executive lead position with Hamilton uh, 350 uh, and she served on the uh, Citizens Climate Action Plan for the city of Hamilton. Thanks Agnes for the experiences they bring to the table and to the discussion today. Reverend Tony Snow is a member of the Stony Nakoda First Nation and works as Indigenous Minister for the Chinook Winds and Pacific Mountain regions of the United Church of Canada. Tony sits on the CANRAC Climate Action Canada Board, the Calgary Interface Council, and for the love of creation, as well as the Calgary Climate Hub. He is the lead minister for the Urban Indigenous Circle and works towards building better outcomes for reconciliation, environmental advocacy, and community healing program. Thanks, Tony, for your unique voice. And last but, lot, but not least, uh, Randy Haluza Delay is cross trained in wildlife biology and the social sciences. He is a former university professor who has co edited books on environmental justice in Canada and how the world's religions are responding to climate change. He just finished a short term stint at Kairos as the Ecological Justice Program Coordinator. Thank you, Randy, for being the inspiration behind this webinar action. Okay, that's enough of me. Let's hear what our panelists have to say, and I'll start with handing it over to Mark. Thank you so much, Mario. Just going to share my screen here. Uh, let me see. She not seeing the right one. It's not good. That's the sec. Okay, I think it must be this one. Uh, a second, just having a difficulty with my screens here. I'm just trying to make sure I actually share the right one, but we'll see if this works or not. Okay, I think it's sharing the right one. That's good. Uh, let's get to the slideshow. Okay, is everyone see the wrong slide, but the slide shows up. Okay, there we go. Just a sec. Sorry about this, folks. This. 
Okay, there we go. So opening reflection, I want you to take a minute now to actually think about something before we begin. Uh, think of a place in nature that you particularly love. And if you want in the chat, you can even put something about that. Uh, it could be a lake, it could be a river, it could be a forest, it could be a mountain, or it could be a name of a place. But what is the place in nature that you particularly love? And the one that's coming to me right away is, is Lake Agnes, which is up above Lake Louise in Map National Park. Um, but I can think of many places. And with that place in mind, reflect what do you feel when you're in that place? And once again, if you could share even just some single words in the chat. Um, so some of the places that come out, Halliburton, Coquitlam River. And what about feelings? What do you feel when you're in a place that you particularly love? Alive, grateful, wonder, peace. Um, connected. Uh, feeling of sun, the warmth, close to God. This is Margaret. And who are the other creatures who accompany you there? When you were in that place, what are some of the other creatures that accompany you? The birds. Um, maybe the sound of squirrels, maybe the, the wind and the leaves, the fish, chipmunks, owls, deer, so many things, so many different living beings, ducks and geese, crows, beach eagles, seagulls. And how do you experience the creator when you're there? Do you experience your connection with the creator when you're in that place? Stand before God as one. So again, it might be peace, joy, um, Thankfulness, once again. Welcoming, embraced, surrounded, perhaps loved. Yes. Connected. And what would you feel in that, if that place were lost forever? If suddenly, if it was, I don't know, clear-cut or bulldozed or polluted, in some way. Grief, sadness, loss, I would think. It was like a desecration. For me, I think it'd be like a desecration. I would feel something violated in my own being, rootlessness, outrage, certainly. So I know this is a brief exercise, but I think it, it tells us how important and how connected we are with creation, with the more than human world. And when we think about the ecological crisis, it really is this kind of very relational crisis. I actually think I have the wrong presentation up here. Sorry, folks. I had two versions of this up. I'm just going to close this one and open the right one. Uh, so, so sorry about that. Um, problem with having too many screens. There, let's go through that. So putting this in perspective, uh, when we think about loss, Approximately 500 square kilometers of forest are lost every day. 
Those are each of those are unique communities of life. That's roughly the size, a little bit smaller than the size of the actual city of Toronto. It's lost every day. Uh, 175 unique species of living organisms lost each day. We don't even know the numbers. But think about each of those being the fruit of billions of years of evolution, and they're lost forever. Many believe we're in the midst of the sixth great mass extinction. And with that, of course, beyond the kind of spiritual and physical cost of all this, there's a loss of resilience, possible ecosystem collapse. And certainly, as many talked about and thinking about losing the place they love, it's a very painful reality because at a deepest level, we are connected with creation and with the more than human world and with all the beings with whom we share this beautiful planet. So why is it important to think about a biodiversity lens when we think about the ecological crisis? I think when we think about the places and the beings we love, and this marvelous variety of beings, there's a concreteness. We're losing concrete creatures and places. And that evokes our strong sense of spiritual and ethical connections as well. I think it makes the crisis very real for us, perhaps less abstract than rising temperatures, as important as that is. Uh, and certainly biodiversity is connected to climate change, land issues, indigenous rights, food production, so many things, as we'll see. Uh, many believe that biodiversity loss is perhaps the planetary boundary that's been most transgressed at this time. And when I talk about planetary boundaries, I'm talking about this kind of abstract diagram you're seeing in front of you, uh, which is really as a way of understanding the interrelatedness of the ecological crisis. And certainly you'll see there that climate change, we're already gone beyond the safe operating space for humanity. Uh, that one novel entities is a little bit difficult to describe, but it would include things like pollution and pesticide use way beyond the boundary. Uh, Biogeochemical flows, that one sounds weird, but it has to do with you know, fertilizer use and manure and, and the phosphorus and, and night and, you know, Nitrogen that gets into the rivers and causes algae blooms, all those types of things. Uh, land system change, deforestation, uh, desertification, all those things. And then we see that one biosphere integrity. And you see how far beyond the limit we actually are there. And of course, all these things are interconnected. I mean, this is a useful way they're kind of divided up. But in reality, all of these are interconnected. Uh, and of course, what that diagram doesn't talk about is the inequality and injustice in the world. And to me, this, this picture, which I think comes from Brazil, I've seen something like this in Brazil in Salvador de Bahia, where you have the apartments with each with a swimming pool on the balcony right next door to a very poor favela, is really a great way of understanding the reality of our world. Uh, because we know that a mere eight billionaires now have the wealth of the poorest half of humanity. Uh, the richest 20% of humans consume about 86% of what this planet produces. And a mere 100 corporations are responsible for you know, nearly three quarters of the greenhouse gas emissions. And in terms of you know, consumer kind of emissions, 10% of, of people are responsible for nearly half of those emissions. But of course, the ones who suffer the most from climate change are not that 10%. And there's so many connections between biodiversity and climate change, drought, heating, all these things drive the loss of species. But also when we lose a forest, when we lose something like the Amazonian rainforest is the air conditioner of the planet that also exacerbates climate change. And think about soil. We often don't think about soil, but soil is a miracle. Soil is full of biodiversity, and it is the largest land-based carbon sink. When we destroy soil, we put carbon into the air. And actually, a good amount of the carbon that's currently in the atmosphere comes from soil. 
And if we want to sequester that carbon again, we need to restore soil. There's connections to the waters, plastic pollution, ocean acidification, driving biodiversity loss in the seas. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, fertilizer and manure pollution causing hypoxic zones where no very little aquatic life can live. And we're even getting to the point where there may be more plastics in the oceans by 2050 than the weight of fish that's currently lived there. And connections, of course, to social justice. Uh, we know that indigenous peoples inhabit uh, about 20% of the Earth's surface area on land, but those territories contain 80% of the Earth's remaining biodiversity. So probably one of the best ways to preserve biodiversity is by strengthening indigenous land rights and land back. Uh, at the same time, mining, deforestation, all these extractive activities, so-called development projects, threaten biodiversity, but also the livelihoods of many of the poorest people on earth. Uh, and even the destruction of forests and ecosystems leading to diseases crossing into humans. And once again, causing suffering, particularly among the poorest. Uh, so what we really have is an interconnected crisis. We need to move beyond the language of an environmental crisis or even a climate crisis. This is a crisis of our home, the oikos, that's where eco comes from. It's a crisis of our common home. Uh, and I think also when we talk about ecology, we could also think about this figurative, uh, figuratively of trying to recover the logic or the wisdom manifest in our common home and all of this great diversity of beings. Uh, as when Ona Leduc points out, uh, you know, if we see the world as a rich ore body or a playground, uh, then we'll tend to want to exploit it. But if we understand our connection to creation as a source of great spiritual and cultural enrichment, and we exercise care, perhaps we'll have another way of uh, treating our common home. So I would say what we're suffering, the biodiversity crisis also manifests a deeper spiritual or ethical crisis. Uh, in Laudato Si, the one very important passage that I think gets mistranslated in English is this idea that the present ecological crisis is, and in English they put a small sign, but in Italian, Spanish, everything else, it's a closion, which is a concrete manifestation of the ethical, cultural, and spiritual crisis of modernity. So the importance of realizing also this need of ecological conversion to address the crisis. Thomas Berry talks about the loss of meaning that happens when we lose species and places, uh, that humans could only have evolved in a time and place as beautiful as the Cenozoic era on Earth, that our intelligence our spirit, our emotions are bonded to this place. And that we find ourselves, he says, ethically destitute when for the first time we're faced with this ultimacy of what he calls biocide or geocide, but which nowadays we generally call ecocide, which is uh, perhaps the key ethical question of our time. He says, you know, we know how to do it. We've talked about suicide, homicide, even genocide, but now we're confronted with the ultimacy of, you know, the extinction of the vulnerable life systems of the earth itself and all these beautiful manifold creatures. Meister Eckert wrote uh, that every creature is full of God and is a book about God. If I spent enough time with the tiniest creature, even a caterpillar, I'd never have to prepare a sermon. So full of God is every creature. Uh, and similarly, Pope Francis in Laudato Si writes that each creature has its own purpose. None is superfluous. The entire material universe speaks of God's love, God's boundless affection for us. Soil, water, mountains, everything is as it were, a caress of God 
So as we lose this community of creatures, we're also losing that very caress of God. I'd just like to conclude by saying, I think it's important that we realize that we as humans cannot save the earth alone. What you're seeing there in the background actually is the lowest plateau ecological restoration project. From the, from the left to the right, there's only 10 years. Humans can play a role in helping to heal the earth if we learn to work with other creatures. I think we think that because some of us, it's really that 10% richest people have created the crisis that we have to solve the problem alone. But in actual fact, we need the diverse wisdom of all the creatures. As humans, I don't know, as a human, I don't know how to create fertile soil, but the microbes do. There's a whole ecosystem that knows how to do this. If we can learn to tap into the wisdom of other beings and be authentic, respectful allies of other beings and of all the different cultures, religions, and peoples of the earth, then I think there's a great possibility of actually addressing this crisis. We need to open ourselves to the wisdom of the creator manifest in creation. And to finish with this quote from uh, Rainer Maria Rilke, if we surrendered to Earth's intelligence, to Earth's wisdom, we could rise up rooted like trees. But instead we entangle ourselves in knots of our make, own making and struggle lonely and confused. So it's by reconnecting with this great earth community that we can find the wisdom, the inspiration, and the power to really uh, address the ecological crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Really appreciate this. Tony? Thank you. <clears throat> just want to uh, offer a couple of words here uh, for our time together and some connection. I, I really appreciate what Mark said and how that is an important uh, launching off point for this next sort of idea. And here, what I'm thinking around is the idea of care for the earth and care for creation, care for all living, animate and inanimate things. Uh, each has a purpose. And this is part of our tradition around indigenous knowledge. So each has a spirit, each has a, a holy understanding. Our goal in this life is to find, to live in balance, to find that balance, and to flourish from connections with all living things. And by this, to live out an interconnectivity, one that understands the constraints and boundaries of our existence, and where we find understanding we find the laws of creation. And by respecting the boundary of our existence, we allow for the flourishing of our biodiversity. And so you see in many instances, 80% of the uh, biodiversity is, is being protected by indigenous communities. And that is uh, at the peril of those communities and how they must suffer in order to uh, protect the uh, the world, the creation for all humanity. In our traditions, uh, and this comes from the uh, the ecumenical conference that we held here in Morley, and the elders who spoke there, uh, theologians and uh, wisdom keepers, saying that uh, we never ate the apple, that we did not disobey God in this land, and so we don't have a connection to this idea of original sin. We don't have this connection of uh, being disobedient. Our name, in fact, Yarhe Nakoda means uh, pure or obedient ones, obedient children of God. And that's how we view ourselves. And so having experienced um, colonialism, that quote is very interesting uh, that was uh, shared from the Ladado Si uh, movement saying that concrete manifestation of the ethical, cultural, spiritual crisis of, of, of modernity. And when we think about modernity, we think about the uh, movement toward um, a differentiation between uh, power dynamics and relations of knowledge and, and the inception of that knowledge into uh, these 
redefined systems. And so we have an enlightenment period. We have a, a process where people have uh, regained a sense of uh, autonomy to the self and to the body to integrate knowledge in a different way, as opposed to being dictated from a um, crown or from a uh, uh, the ecclesiastical body that defines the world for them. And so when we think about the way that Indigenous cultures have um, not experienced that, we have experienced colonialism, we have experienced the oppression and the ways of uh, these uh, environments that have enacted upon us a way of knowledge. We have not in ourselves been through modernity. We have found in our own path a way of practice and understanding that we have had to withhold against a system that has uh, sought to redefine and contextualize our understandings in, a, in an environment that um, may or may not fit for that belief system. So one of the things that um, we have here is in my previous work, before my work in ministry, I was working for decades with uh, public engagement and with Indigenous consultation with elders and traditional knowledge keepers and communities and have helped to interpret, uh, translate and mediate difficult conversations and understandings related to federal programs or, uh, around forestry, habitat, resource extraction, other flashpoints in our community where these uh, beliefs and, and understandings have uh, held a, a different um, understand a different way for us to work through uh, this form of relationship. So when we talk about mediation and the broadening of understanding of nature and ecology and practice, we begin to see the Western concept of stewardship as something that is managed from its colonial and imperial constraints. And so it has a, a formulation within a set of boundaries and a set of tools that are used, uh, legislation, policy, and other ways to redefine relationship and, and bring the entire community into like-mindedness. But that's always at, at the peril of, of being an enforceable uh, will upon the people. And we have not gotten to the point where we have uh, a wholesale um, involvement and evolving understanding of where we uh, need to have our um, particular works in effect. What I'm talking about is that today we see uh, the address of a climate crisis in many forums and in many decision-making uh, apparatuses, tribunals, or other forms, and we see where key lobbyists and corporate interests have actively worked against Indigenous interests. And so there's not a level playing field when we start to talk about stewardship and creation care. We're talking about uh, ways in which the system is being upheld and not in favor of or listening to Indigenous voices and the voices of people who are uh, being affected by these communities. And so when we start to think about uh, how we address uh, issues, it's often um, from the position of things that are watered down in a way that homogenizes and neutralizes ecological concerns that are pitting us as Indigenous people against other stakeholders in a fight for compromise. And so before issues, impacts, and cumulative effects are properly understood, we are often sidelined by collective agreements, tangential bargaining for mitigation, presenting opportunities selectively to decision makers, not actively engaging in the enterprise of rehabilitation, reconciliation with the earth, and repair. So these ideas that are at the forefront of what our elders are trying to bring forward and what we're trying to engage with are often... Uh, at a disadvantage when it comes to sort of the nuts and bolts of the system that we have to enter that dialogue within. And so that we have not had a fulsome understanding of what our impacts are and how what we need to do to reverse course in environmental destruction in order to reform a balance where all factors are weighed equally between the land inanimate and animate in their interconnections. And so this year we hear of the uh, COP15 Biodiversity Agreement, 
Uh, and we must determine what that agreement means in terms of collective cooperation upon the land and with the land, what it means for allowing creation to do its work. Oftentimes in our tradition, um, lands would be left for the earth to rehabilitate, the earth to heal from our involvement. And this is after fires, this is after uh, particular disasters, or when a time of uh, quiet was needed for the earth treating it like a person, treating it like someone who needed that type of care for its trauma. And we don't have that mindset stepping into this. And it's often odd to have that conversation with engineers, with scientists and others, to get them to understand that there's a balance of creation in our call for creation, in our exploitation of creation, something that gives back. And that is holistically coming from many Indigenous communities whose primary um, understanding of the earth is sharing and balancing our involvement in a way that is helpful and healing to the earth. And so as we start to see this agreement um, that we are not party to, we are assured that our interests fall under the umbrella of a general movement towards care. It is a factor based on trust and based on understanding, based on the value that is nowhere questioned or transposed in terms relevant to an Indigenous worldview. Many of our actions moving forward depend on the nature of our relationships. Our elders are instructive on what these relationships have been and how they have evolved. In 2010, we had with the Parks Canada a um, MOU that was signed that sought to bring input from in the stony people who were the uh, traditional land users in that area who had been there historically for millennia to take care of the mountain areas and treated it as a sacred site much like we would talk about the holy land this is what uh, the banff area is to us and so there is uh, significant sites of um, sacred waters of sacred stories that have happened and spirits that live in the area and there's also a plethora of medicines and other uh, plant life that uh, because of the nature of the Banff parks that we have been excluded from. Uh, particularly, uh, they built jails in the towns that uh, are there historically or CMP posts that are only there to arrest Indigenous people if they came off their lands, if they came off their reserve. And so there's long-standing and intergenerational um, abuses that we need to uh, confront and understand and to work through so that we can find a better way of bridging this conversation about traditional knowledge and the deep ecological understanding of significant sites to find an environmental balance for mountain ecosystems and other ecosystems in that way because in each of these um, planes of stewardship there is this Inter deep interconnection between the Indigenous people of that area and how they form relationship through their ceremony, through their uh, understanding, through their traditions, through their oral history about the area that inform how they are to be in the land. And so with that idea of uh, land in uh, the territory of sacred space and sacred landscapes, it is this uh, forum of myth and legend. It is the forum of securing deep understandings with the inner workings of ecology and of the, the life of that ecology that is understood in a way that may not be compatible to those that uh, seek uh, different answers or different quantifiability for uh, the ways that we bring in uh, information and start to adjudicate that for the long-term management and well-being of an area and not thinking of its spiritual quality, not thinking of its uh, sacredness. And so there's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done as we step into this and start to talk about what biodiversity means in the broader sense and whose bio vision of bio biodiversity is actually at play in many of our uh, interactions, whose voices are being lifted up and, and whose are being silenced in these ways that uh, can offer insight or new ways of uh, broaching um, some of these uh, understandings that will 
form the basis of a new relationship going forward. And so I just wanted to share that for this time being and thank you for this opportunity to, to come here and to share, as my father would say, a bit of information about nature's university and what that means for our uh, positions going forward. And thank you. Thank you so, so much, Tony. Very insightful, thank you. Agnes? Thank you, Mario, and uh, for bringing us together. Thank you, Mark and, and Tony for your wisdom and Randolph for the, for the wisdoms coming afterwards. And thank all of you for, for joining this webinar. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it was like to be uh, on the ground at COP15. Attending COP15 was an exhilarating experience. The conference was a large event with people moving fast, most wearing masks. So it was uh, difficult to identify people by sight and catch a few moments to speak with delegates. Home base for me was the multi-faith pavilion, a first at similar UN conferences. Some of the participants uh, are here in this, um, in this photo and uh, they met on December 12th with the executive secretary of the um, biodiversity conference that's uh, Elizabeth Memmer in the center there. Gopal Patel, coordinator for Faiths at COP15 affirmed that faith groups were present to help bring moral urgency to the talks, as well as mobilize our communities to implement the global biodiversity frameworks goals. Next slide, please. Hundreds of side events supported the conference. The Laudato Si movement team were invited to a mass at the Archdiocese of Montreal with Bishop Alain Faubert and a service at uh, Centre St. Jack with Pastor Graham Singh. In both cases, there was strong support for the work of faith-based delegates who were hailed as modern day prophets and our efforts were prayed for by the congregations there. We joined the March for Biodiversity and Human Rights organized by collectivecop15.org. The march was led by indigenous um, from nations on Turtle Island and around the world with youth, faith communities, civil society groups, environmental and social justice activists, we gathered on the streets of Montreal. The predominant message was for ambitious goals to reverse biodiversity loss, along with practical plans to achieve those goals. Next slide, please. Some of the best paths to action at UN conferences are showcased inside events. Often I saw and heard evidence that Indigenous peoples have and continue to be leaders in protecting biodiversity under their care. Side events at the Indigenous village showcased projects here and abroad that are successfully working with governments to achieve thriving biodiversity zones. Inside the conference, we were reminded of the stark realities in Canada where Indigenous people continue to call attention to practices of biological destruction and degradation enabled by provincial and federal policies and perpetrated by large corporate entities despite growing opposition from indigenous land defenders and members of civil society. Next slide, please. Meeting with delegates to deliver messages of concern or suggestions for plans of action can be complicated. Successful interactions are often planned months in advance. The Laudato Sea Movement team hosted a side event based on the film, The Letter. Our five confirmed panelists included representatives from the governments of Canada and Kenya, and we were guaranteed 45 minutes to engage with them. Stephen DeBoer, from, uh, representing the government of Canada, spoke of Canada's understanding that, quote, Indigenous language and culture reveal important details about our local ecosystems. Key to restoring a balance with nature in Canada is close collaboration and partnership with First Nation, Inuit and Métis, end quote. And I would say that our responsibility is to hold our governments to their words. Following that event, I spoke with Stephen DeBoer and I gave him the Mouvement Laudato Si Movement statement a document written to convey the concerns of MLSM Canada membership and in support of a similar message from the joint ecological ministries representing thousands of Canadians. Both documents you'll be able to uh, read when, um, 
Mario sends each of us um, a resource list after this video. Deboer was grateful that the documents presented were in French and English, and he promised to take them to Minister Stephen Gibault and to work to achieve our goals to the best of his ability. Caroline Carew, the Dato C movement lead on biodiversity, was part of the group in that first slide that I showed you who met with Elizabeth Merma. That private meeting was guarded with security. It was limited with the number of participants who could be there and had restrictions around media use. My colleague was lucky to get a few minutes with Merma when she delivered the global Laudato Si movement petition signed by hundreds of thousands, along with several other messages, including the ones I mentioned earlier. Merma welcomed religious organizations becoming more engaged on biodiversity. When asked what she would wish from the faith group, she replied, I wish for a lot. She told us, you must take the messages you've delivered here to me back to your own faith communities and government officials. She said, if a sheikh, an imam, or priest stands up, people listen to them. And so you must use that power to mobilize people at the grassroots. And I would add that if any person speaks from convictions of faith, they will have an important impact. So now, thank you. And I will pass to the next panelist, my, my colleague, Monica Tang. Thank you very much, Agnes, and appreciate uh, all of the insights and uh, knowledge shared by my co-panelists so far. Um, I will speak to you a brief overview of the commitments at international levels, domestic actions, and time permitting a couple of positive innovations I've seen emerge in biodiversity stewardship. Um, the recent international frameworks include the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework that my colleague Agnes had spent some time uh, speaking to, uh, to her interactions and advocacy at the, um, at the conference, and the Global Biodiversity Framework work set policy direction to halt nature loss and renewed commitments towards bio biodiversity targets that are to be taken up by um, governments around the world, as well as the uh, more recent UN High Seas Treaty and the key sort of point in that High Seas Treaty, including that uh, international waters can now be protected with marine protected areas and uh, to support the global goal of protecting 30% of the ocean by 2030. This is crucial because activities that are uh, such as illegal, unregulated, and unreported fisheries and other destructive uh, activities are often occurring in international waters outside of um, outside of national government's uh, oversights. Canada has also established some domestic targets to support these uh, international frameworks, including uh, a target to conserve 30% of lands and waters by 2030. Mario has posted a link in the chat where uh, folks can see the, uh, the government's uh, progress towards that, towards these targets, and also where these uh, protected and conservation areas are. The I seem to have lost Monica momentarily. There we go. Sorry, Monica, we lost your voice for the last five seconds or so. If you could repeat the last few sentences, that would be great. Oh, Thank certainly. You. Um, my yeah. last sentence was just that um, Canada's approach uh, focuses on addressing the twin crises of biodiversity loss as well as climate change with an emphasis on nature-based climate solutions, including areas protecting areas such as coastal wetlands, forests, and other um, valuable ecological areas important to, uh, important to Canada. The approach includes uh, is pivoting towards uh, partnerships, especially with Indigenous governments. And uh, as cited by some of my co-panelists earlier, Parks Canada data also supports that biodiversity rates in Canada are amongst the highest inside uh, Indigenous government-led protected and con conserved areas. I'll speak for a few moments about uh, marine protected areas and uh, marine area-based conservation uh, measures as they also contribute to Canada's domestic targets and actions. And uh, these were the establishment and uh, implementation of these marine protected areas require cooperation amongst uh, many different uh, governments and entities, including Canada, provinces, as well as Indigenous governments. Speaking from my own professional experiences, effective uh, marine protected areas require collaborative management regimes, being designed and integrating science and uh, traditional knowledge in their governance, as well as mechanisms for compliance and enforcement so that activities that are occurring within those marine protected areas are consistent with the management plans that are developed. Otherwise, they really are just 
parks on paper. And finally, we've uh, also seen some uh, Indigenous-led partnerships that are resulting in innovations that are um, that are advancing the work forward, such as Indigenous guardians programs that are led by uh, first individual First Nations, as well as shared stewardship networks that uh, support through uh, coordinating resources, te technology, information and knowledge sharing, and, uh, and work with other entities as well. There's a new funding model, such as the ones followed by Coast Funds that leverage private donations, as well as public sector funding to support these guardians programs and to ensure that they are Indigenous led and, uh, and implemented via Indigenous governments. I'll uh, share some of those. Uh, I'll share some of those resources in the uh, in the chat. We sort of we we won't have a lot of time to go through those today, but um, folks can take a look at some of the uh, the resources produced by the uh, Coastal Guardian Watchmen and Coastal First Nations as examples of Indigenous led initiatives. Thank you so much, Monica. We really appreciate your uh, insights and uh, all of that knowledge. Uh, by being uh, inside and, and really leading the governance frameworks for all of these. Uh, Randy? All right, everybody. Hello, welcome to this webinar. Um, I'm hoping that right now you can see my, my screen and it says moving toward action, biodiversity and faith groups. Is that showing there? Yes, sir, yeah, good deal. Sorry, I saw Mario with the thumbs up. Um, and that's what I wanna have us talk about now. Like you've heard a lot of detail and Monica especially identified some very specific international agreements and policy uh, instruments that were, um, were discussed, in many ways agreed on, and now need to be implemented coming out of COP15. Um, but I want to take us back a little bit first and have us think about some bigger picture sorts of things and also how can we be most effective as faith groups and as individuals who are members of faith groups. And I'll identify the fact that I speak out of the Christian tradition, although I have worked on environmental issues in interfaith contexts quite considerably. I've spoken with uh, Jain, Muslim, Buddhist, Catholic, Lutheran, Evangelical Christian and other faith groups. And I'm very happy to keep talking about that. Um, I think that the environment is one of the areas in which we, as faith groups, work together very well or can work together well. We may disagree about a lot of other things, but um, very few actually disagree about caring for nature. I'll put it that way. And I'll discuss things a little bit later, some detail. Um, but some of that bigger framework is to... Uh, Okay, I'm looking forward here. Now, is to think back, if you remember 1989, the quote, person of the year was actually the planet of the year. Because this was 20 years after the first Earth Day. That was 33 years ago. And we're still talking about the endangered Earth. And all of the scientific facts are that things are getting worse and we're accelerating the processes. 50% uh, of climate emissions, for example, have been emitted since around 1990, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so what are some of the, what are the solutions? Where are the solutions gonna come from? One proposal is that it comes from science. And if we just follow the science, we'll do the right thing and we'll protect the planet. Another suggestion is technology, you know, whether it's renewable energies, whether it's green vehicles or greening the economy or um, carbon capture and storage or other ways to technologically geoengineer the planet. Is technology the solution or in a religious context, uh, is technology our salvation? Social practices is another avenue by which um, it is possible for us to change the ways that we as human beings who are having a planetary wide impact, that we're in the context of the Anthropocene where the human beings are a force, not just a biological, but geological uh, nature. We're reshaping the entire planet and the planetary boundaries that Mark discussed are really important to recognize that it's through human action that all of those critical earth systems are being impacted and de degraded 
and leading towards um, not not the end of life on Earth, but but a drastically changed planet, perhaps, or at least a drastically changed planet in the context of human civilization. We've been in a remarkably steady period of uh, a little over 10,000 years, um, but all of a sudden things are changing quite dramatically and that stability has given us the capacity to expand human civilization in, in some pretty profound ways. So social practices will likely need to change and social practices look different in different locations around the planet. Um, it is also possible, and Mark brought up uh, the area of emotions. I, I wrote this thing for Canadian Mennonite magazine, talking about the biodiversity crisis a little over a year ago, and taking off of the Hebrew prophet Isaiah, who wrote, woe be unto you, who add field unto field and house unto house until you live alone in the land. Uh, so I talked about the scientific evidence of the 70% decline of insects in some areas of Europe and North America and, and elsewhere. Uh, but I also brought up the emotional things, maybe the human species, which absolutely requires an interconnected ecological web. I mean, one third of our plants for, that we eat uh, are fertilized by various forms of insects. We cannot live without them. Not only would we be emotionally lonely as a species, we just wouldn't be able to survive because the web of life would fall apart so badly. But another, so emotions may be a source or a, a an avenue of how do we deal with things. And then last of all, I wanna say um, religiously, theologically, we need to, think differently, be different, act differently. And this just came out in Canadian Mennonite Magazine actually today, and it's on the website of uh, Canadian Magazine, uh, Mennonite's uh, Magazine's website. Um, can we see the chickadees as a sacrament, as a sign of God, or even more so a, a presence of God? and not just narrow ourselves anthropocentrically to thinking of human beings as having a relationship with the creator. So in terms of moving towards action, I think that there's three levels to really focus on, and I'll do these relatively briefly. One would be at the personal level, another would be at the group or congregational level, but also really important is at the collective and societal levels. So personally, it's our lives, our lifestyles that matter. And not all of us have the same lifestyles. Not all, all of us will have the same impact on the planet. However, the vast majority of Canadians really are in the 1% of the human species. So thinking through our lifestyles and then doing advocacy to politicians, but also to institutions, tell business to do things differently, tell religious traditions to do things differently, have us rethink the ways that we operate is really important. And so I absolutely encourage everybody to go to the fortheloveofcreation.ca website or the cpj.ca, the Citizens for Public Justice website, and sign on to those advocacy letters to politicians, but then also do the advocacy to other social uh, institutions as well. Collectively or societally, we need to change worldviews, our social practices, our norms, and our institutions. And I really believe that faith groups have the resources to be agents of cultural change. And that's what I'm talking about here. We're talking about socio-political and socio-cultural change, not just technological, but not just political advocacy, because we need to change our cultural values and norms and practices as well. And then all of us belong to various forms of groups in society, whether those are a local soccer club or whether it's in a faith congregation. And to be honest, this is the most effective level of effective action because our relationships are the major vector of change. People listen to the people that they consider to be significant, that they like, that they know, that they feel are influential. It might be some celebrity influencer or a TikTok person, but the majority of people are you know, our families, our friends, the other people that we interact with on a regular sort of basis. So operate at that level of group, of you know, mobilize your social network 
talk about things and tell them to do things, ask them to do things uh, and do it in a way that's meaningful for, for everybody. Um, all of these are learning processes. And so I wanna talk a little bit about learning right now in terms of adult learning, but they're also things that relate to leadership. So we need to get our faith leaders discussing these issues and saying that they're important. Um, in terms of cultural resources, these are just a couple of quotes that uh, Mark did not use. I pulled up really, really quickly because he and I were sharing resources and all of a sudden I found out that I had a couple of slides that were exactly identical to him. So, um, you know, this one, the one who plants trees, knowing that he or she will never sit in their, um, in their shade has sorry, I can't see all my, I think, uh, has at least started to understand the meaning of life. Now that's really, really different than the way we often think about things in terms of what's the instrumental value for us. This is not about a value for us. This is, you know, we plant trees uh, and there, there's a verse in the Quran which says the same thing, that we plant trees for the future. from the Christian tradition, the Eastern Orthodox, why was the human being created? Well, in order that by apprehending God's creatures, the human being might contem contemplate and glorify God who created them. Um, one of the things about doing interfaith work is to recognize that we will speak in different languages. We will draw on different resources. And that's good because we can learn from each other. It's also really, really important. Not everybody talks about love of creation, for example, because that requires a sense of a creator. So caring for nature might be a more interfaith way of talking about things. Similarly, the concept of justice is not the same in all traditions. So caring or compassion or duty might also be language that we use. So some adult learning notes for you as you try to do work in your own faith context. So to become most meaningful, learning requires these elements. First of all, let's recognize the facts that most learning occurs in a social context. That's why I emphasize social networks at the very beginning. But also new information must be incorporated by the learner. And that usually means incorporated into an already well-developed understanding of the world or frame of reference. So they're having to adjust and accommodate to new information. And that's a big reason why we see elements of resistance or denial or things like that, because it might actually contest some of what people have already thought or believed. Uh, there also needs to be relevancy, especially for an adult learner. Children are a little bit differently because they're often thinking of school as preparation for becoming an adult. But for adults, we need to think about how does this matter here and now, not 30 years down the road, not in some other context, but here and now. Uh, and in addition, um, learning takes place again in that community of learners. And so we do that educational work. Really, we're doing facilitation work rather than teaching work. Okay, so Within the Christian tradition, I really like this as a model because there's not just one way to think about things. And I know that other religious traditions also have a variety of understandings and approaches. And so these are what uh, theologian Larry Rasmussen called living streams flowing together. And these are all drawn from the Christian tradition. But if you're not from a Christian background, you will likely see some resonance. So three major ones are dominion, which is that dominant and domineering model that has uh, been criticized rightly as being part of the destructive and colonial and industrial uh, understanding of the earth and therefore has led very much towards the ecological crisis. Uh, stewardship is another model. That's really a benevolent managing. I don't like stewardship very much because I don't think it goes far enough. Uh, Eco-justice is also really important. The cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. We can't have sustainability without justice. Similarly, we can't have justice without sustainability. And you could say that nature is one of the least of these, which is a reference to, uh, to Matthew uh, in, the, uh, in the Gospels. 
Um, so we're going to take away the dominion model and bring up some other ones as well. You could talk about partnership as humans, a part of nature, more of a Franciscan approach to things. And I actually like this as a better term than what some people will call creation spirituality, which gets us into a more complicated theological discussion. Uh, a sacramental approach, which is the imminent presence of the divine, or an eco-feminist approach which has often said that the domination of women is very similar to the domination of the earth or to mother nature, um, or a science plus approach. So not just science, but science plus the cosmologies that come out of a theological and religious understanding. And then I've also included here within a Christian context, again, to pay attention to global Christianity, that other cultures have knowledge also that can really contribute. Um, I've said other faiths do, but other cultures and theologians coming from those cultures may contest Eurocentrism. And I'm really glad that Tony brought up the, the problem of modernity. So for example, this book is one of my all-time favorite books. And I taught it a number of years in a uh, particular class in when I was teaching, um, Shalom and the Community of Creation. So the idea of Shalom is making peace or peacemaking. Oftentimes we limit, it, limit that to the human community. But if we take an indigenous perspective on the in community of all creation, what does shalom for that community of all creation look like? Uh, and Randy Woodley brings up and critiques uh, Eurocentric approaches to things, many of which are uh, a form of modernity. Um, and then this book is one of, also one of my favorites from a Muslim environmentalist uh, in the UK, Science on the Earth, or the Ayat of creation, Islam, modernity, and the climate crisis. And this has one of the best analyses of modernity that I've seen in a very readable kind of form. And for me, being part of another Abrahamic faith, it was really interesting and really enlightening for me to, to look at it from a slightly different take. Um, so the damage being done to creation means asking new questions of old wisdom. We have to do a reinterpretation. We have to ask our theological questions and then those cultural questions. And I'm going to skip right through these really fast. So we can talk about them another time if you want. Learning for lifestyles to embody caring for creation will need three elements. First of all, it will need details. How do we live in an ecologically sound sort of way? How do we do advocacy? How do we change the uh, renewable solar panels on a faith building or or any of the other sorts of things that are really important but also it needs that community because we're talking about an alternate way of living and a worldview that actually is counter to most of our canadian society so we need that community to support the maintenance of this alternate way of living and way of thinking and last of all, it's really important that we have an analysis of the social structures that do inhibit caring ecological lifestyles. This needs to be a religiously oriented analysis. It also needs to be a social scientific analysis. Like we have to ask the question, why is change so hard? Why have we been talking, not since 1989, but since the 1960s, since the 1950s, and actually the first uh, hypotheses about the role of industrialization, adding carbon to the atmosphere, and therefore changing the climate, were proposed in the 1890s. Why is change so hard? Only an analysis of these social structures will help us to understand that thing. You're going to see this fellow come up again in a second, so I'm going to skip him. There's lots of obstacles and opportunities within faith communities. There's lots of reasons to think that faith groups are not fertile ground for growing in environmental awareness. But there's also lots of opportunities to expect environmental awareness to grow well in faith groups. Now, here's what I wanna leave you with, this quote and this fella, because I just think it's fun. Um, and he looks like he's having fun, even if he's got bugs in his teeth. Wendell Berry in a really neat poem wrote, be joyful though you have considered all the facts. And for me, that's really important. You know, I know the data. Um, I mean, that was my professional job is to, to know it, to research it, to 
uh, do I dare say communicate it? Because I couldn't communicate the facts as they are because they're pretty bad. So I had to also help people find motivation and find hope. And to be honest, to find some joy, though we have considered all the facts. So that's what I want to leave you with today. Um, we can improve things. There's lots of proposals out there. And as Monica and others have said, you know, COP15, COP27, and other international uh, movements and agreements and meetings are taking place. We need to keep pushing the powers that be and be joyful in doing so, but also be active and make sure that we do so. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. And your thanks to all of those, uh, all of the panelists for their valuable contributions. I personally have learned a lot and I hope this was the case for everyone as well. Time for questions, folks. Please share any questions that you may have either via chat and, or by raising your virtual hand and unmuting to speak out loud. Um, in the interest of time, let's try to direct the questions towards certain panelists. But if you do have a question that spans multiple panelists, you can also direct the question to more than one panelist. If you do wish to speak out loud, please use the raise hand virtual function. Can I start with a question? Hey. This one would be for Monica. Monica, which do you feel of all of the things that you saw coming out of COP15, maybe Agnes can, can discuss this too, which do you feel are, are going to have the biggest impact and be the most productive? That is a, that is a good question, Randy. Quite, um, yeah, quite, a, quite several angles. I think just um, based on observing both COP15 and COP27, I've become convinced that uh, shifting financial flows is uh, is quite crucial. The um, in, a, in a number of the areas that I work in, securing sustained financial commitments for conservation areas, protected areas, and uh, also um, working in a way that um, you know communities, nations, um, groups can sort of still retain a livelihood, despite sort of, you know, despite working within a conservation and protected area, it seems to me that um, redirecting financial flows from destructive activities towards uh, activities that are regenerative will be the uh, will be the key. And that requires, con you know, cooperation, as well as innovation from everyone everywhere. I think I'd agree with Monica because um, um, really, I, I hate the term money drives the world, but, but in reality, in, in many respects it does. And there was a lot of talk about um, ecological finance at COP15. Um, and there's so many ways to approach redirecting those flows. And some of the considerations um, um, have, have some concerns around the motivation uh, for monetizing nature itself. So while um, discussing the fact that uh, money needs to be directed in support of nature, we also have to remember um, what's motivating that redirection. And I think for us, it's definitely care of creation, care of all of the life forms that support us and that we should be supporting them. So. Um, combining that with, with thoughts about how money is directed needs to work together with Indigenous worldviews. So I think those are some of the things that um, were positive came out of COP. There was a lot of good promises in that direction. And I think it's up to us to, to hold our governments um, and ourselves to those um, ideals. If I can make one quick comment, not so much direct on the question, but something I, I, I sat in on some of the negotiating sessions at COP15, I found it really interesting. And one of them was when they were talking about including agroecology 
in the discussions, which was great. They included it in the final document, but at the cost of also including this vague phrase and sustainable intensification, it was all, all, often in the agreement, there's like these trade-offs. So like someone got something at, at the price of someone else, I think probably large corporate agriculture, getting another phrase in. So I think the really important thing is for us uh, to pressure our politicians to, you know, to live out the good parts of the text and also, you know, the, to make to make it something more than what's just written on the page. Uh, because there, in actual fact, in the negotiations, there were these competing interests at stake, right? Thank you. Lots of thoughtful comments. Um, Karen Rogers, I didn't know if I misunderstood your pattern or if you had a question. Uh, yes, I did. <laughs> if I could. Hi, I'm um, from uh, New Brunswick, Moncton Review area. Um, and I guess I really appreciate, Mark, your, your idea of what, the learning, because I'm, I'm a teacher, so that was... <laughs> It kind of spoke to me about making it very personal, very social. And I'm wondering if anyone has any ideas. I'm working with our church. Our church has done some great things over the years uh, to have a smaller footprint. And so I'm thinking very local right now um, in order to create, I guess, a model or a way of being uh, locally that we can then expand into these um, larger areas that everyone has been speaking about tonight. Um, so for example, during the pandemic, we had to be outside. So we made our outside part of our, our, uh, our faith community. Um, we created pollinator gardens. We spoke to um, uh, adults as well as children about the importance of being in nature and it being, we were being part of it. Um, but where do you see, I guess, have the learning from this local small part, how we can take that and expand it, I guess, into the more global or national uh, arena and, and um, take that leap of faith, I guess, so to speak. It, I guess I'm struggling with where, where do I, now that we start this part in our church in this local area, and we would like to expand it to other churches and other faiths, in the area, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not being very clear, but how would you see that expanding? If, if I could, I can jump in with a small suggestion that begins in the local. So um, the Move All Adoption Seed Movement Canada is, part, is a project of Faith in the Common Good. And Faith in the Common Good has for years had a program called Greening Sacred Spaces. And, and, and that program, um, allows and, and encourages places of worship to benchmark many different ways that they are greening their community. You talked about gardens, so that is a component of it, but it's also um, how you manage energy, how you um, educate your own community and beyond. And a really key component to that program is celebrating the successes and it's in the celebrations that um, um, give the opportunity to share what you've done with others and to expand the conversation. Um, so much of, um, I, I like what, what Randy said about bringing joy. And I think that that's one of the greatest challenges when you know what we're up against, finding and sharing the joy is, is one of the things that we really need to work on doing. So, um, you know, benchmarking what you've done and then celebrating each step of the way. The celebrations themselves are a way to expand the conversations and to share with others. Yeah, I think a lot of what you're asking, Karen, is um, is about communication. And you do, you need to share what you're doing. You know, have a sign outside your church building or something or um, get it in the, in the local newspaper. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's about a public witness and faith communities have always tried to do something of a public witness. Um, some are more oriented towards that than others, but the point is to say, this is what we're doing. 
you could do it too. Come on and join us in this kind of thing. So it's not a, you know, you know, we're better than you because we've done this kind of thing, but it's like, woohoo, let's do it together and let's be part of a movement. Um, and yeah, I wanted to comment on something that um, Stephanie just wrote in the chat. Uh, she said she found the most encouraging thing at COP15 to be the business coalition's statement urging parties to regulate business. You know what? Businesses are okay with that. The most important thing for businesses is to have a stable ground to operate on, you know, which includes kind of a sense of where things are happening over the next few years. And so if they can see the writing on the wall in a certain direction, they actually would prefer for government to kind of set the parameters and everybody has to play on the same field. Otherwise, all you're doing is making a moral argument to say, you know, you should be good businesses and some will and some won't. Uh, and, and some will do it because there's lots of good reasons to do it and they want that goodwill attached to their name, uh, but it still becomes a, an unstable ground with a lot of insecurity. I was in Alberta for decades, and even back in the early 2000s uh, at the Cumulative Effects Management Association that kind of operated in the Fort McMurray area around the oil sands, businesses were at the table with environmentalists saying, yep, yeah, okay, you know, what can we agree on? And then we'll propose that to the government to, to regulate us so that we know what the rules of the road are. And they were saying the same thing when I was uh, at COP22, the climate COP in Marrakesh back in 2016. They're saying, look, you know, it doesn't matter. We, we know where things are changing to and we just wanna know what, what the rules are gonna be. So as long as we do that, everybody, everybody also wants to do well by other people to some degree. I mean, they, we have different definitions of that. And some people will say doing well is making lots of money so they can it can be passed on too. Um, but I think it's really important that we talk about these things, we look for the shared values, uh, and that we we just work at it. And, and maybe maybe also responding both to Karen's point and the something that's in the in the chat there as well. I mean, I think another really important thing is in terms of the community reaching out to the wider community. Uh, so something like even like letting a local farmers market use a church parking lot or having uh, you know community gardening on church property or land back like sharing land for a, for an indigenous medicine garden and you know to this one about imagination i think an interesting example i know of in that i think too is uh the ignatius guelph center in in uh that the jesuits run which you know is a farm that was converted to organic production and now there's all these kind of allotment gardens that people from the local community come in and they garden there's an old forest there's a there's an old forest restoration project people are coming on to the land you know walking along the river there's uh, a, a ceremonial state space that local indigenous communities are using so I think if, if we can think of creative ways to use uh, property and in in ways to share it widely with the community and invites the broader community in that those things can be kind of contagious uh in terms of inspiring others to do interesting things i'll just uh, briefly just uh, add to randy's comment earlier about uh, business and also the comment that i think stephanie had put in the chat about um you know how businesses are preparing and uh, the conversation in um, in other circles that I've seen is that there is you know businesses are expecting a push uh, from uh, from governments and from other regulators for credible trend you know credible transition plans as well as like a change in international standards to uh, to require more transparent uh, disclosure about some um, about their climate risks and uh, a couple of um, a couple of weeks ago the office of the superintendent of financial institutions in Canada had also uh, released uh, just more information about what they're expecting from federal federally regulated banks, insurance companies, and pension funds in terms of uh, data reporting as well as um, and other other requirements. So um, I think um, I think more proactive organizations are uh, are acting upon this already. Um, but the what I'm seeing what I'm seeing is that um, there is they are expecting a push for uh, for either regulations or 
scrutiny from uh, scrutiny from investors and uh, and international bodies. Thank you. If you do have a final question, please uh, drop it in the chat or, or raise your hand. But I will use my authority here as a host to sneak in my question. I have a question for Tony. Um, how do we remain joyful despite considering all of the facts? And I specifically direct the question to Tony because I think an indigenous view on this carries a unique perspective that we can all uh, benefit from. And I personally grappled with an immense sense of, of loss and even despair after the last IPCC report, which is yet another final warning about the state of the planet um, and the urgency to act. So how do we acquire and sometimes more importantly maintain that level of hope? No, thank you for that, uh, Mario. Uh, one of the things that I, I would caution and, and work toward is the idea of the um, the formulation around our reconciliations that that perform these actions. So what we're hearing from a couple of the uh, uh, panelists is how, in in some instances, they are uh, seeing some natural evolution of uh, spaces and and working through uh, uh, some. Um, community-driven uh, action. And yet my, the question that comes to my mind is around the idea of uh, who is being reconciled with and, and how is that um, incorporation of knowledge from the local area, from those that are historically in those areas uh, being engaged? Because uh, we can go and, and talk to someone who is a um, from a different nation, say from an Eastern tribe that comes to, to Calgary and is uh, vocal in the Banff area, and they can be implementing their uh, perspective, but they haven't talked to the local people. And so there has been no effort at um, reconciliation movement that is actually compatible with what the belief system they're entering into and what the, what the uh, dialogue has been there. And so I think that there's a critical element of understanding our context, of understanding uh, what the work of reconciliation is bringing us into and how we can quantify that through this ongoing work, uh, it's intergenerational work of uh, being in uh, community and relationship. To me, that's that's critical for formation of uh, paths forward because in, in large part, um, a lot of the uh, groups and nations have been very vocal and very um, involved in their uh, process. And where they haven't, um, there is likely a uh, reason for that hindrance, either a corporate interest or something that is withholding, that is uh, holding them in court or, or having them um, sidelined in some way. And we see that in the um, the protests that happen on, on the ground. And so we're, we're seeing flashpoints around that where the um, issues are breaking down because of this lack of involvement and relationship. So when I talk to members specifically of the United Church who have sided alongside uh, one, one side of the community versus another, we don't wanna get into that uh, political play. We want to be that voice of mediation that speaks from the um, that settler community process that seeks to empower the reconciliation on the ground between these groups so that we are not doing more harm by choosing one value over another, but actually listening to and being guided by those Indigenous voices, especially elders and those that that are empowered or that are uh, holding that space historically. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tony. Perfect timing. Um, once again, really huge thanks to all of our panelists for such insightful views and a holistic and wholesome presentation on this crucial topic in my opinion, again, biodiversity is a highly personal matter to me, as Mark alluded in the beginning. Um, 
I often think of how unfaithful it feels to witness the sixth mass extinction in our midst and do too little too late about it. Um, if you would like to join Citizens for Public Justice and for the Love of Creation's climate advocacy efforts, um, please add your voice to our Give It Up for the Earth campaign by signing our open letter, which is addressed to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada, um, Stephen Gibault. Um, again, the sign up process is very quick, but it is a very effective way to get the attention of the ministry. And if you also want to learn more about our campaign, um, it, your personal pledge, the campaign also constitutes a personal pledge for you and your household to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions throughout the period of, of Lent. You can visit that second link. And if you have any questions, comments about tonight, or if you simply would like to get in touch with us at Citizens for Public Justice or with For the Love of Creation, uh, please do email me. My email is available right there. It is mario at cpj.ca. And the recording for this webinar will be available and will be shared with all of you, along with the resources and links that the panelists have used. But just to leave you, I must say thank you so, so much for spending that time of your evening with us. Um, for us, at advocacy organizations like CPJ and FLC, we do this work um, to try and, and, and see that level of engagement and having you come and spend your time is um, the ultimate reward for um, what we get to work for. So. Thank you very much, and I hope you all the best for the rest of your evening and the rest of your week. Thank you.